Amen. That was so beautiful. One of my favorites. Reminded me of uh, heritage singers back in the days. Beautiful. Thank you so much. I want to start with a question for the kids. Kids, ready for a question? Who is the king of the animal kingdom? A kids, the kids. Who is it? The lion. Everybody agrees it's the lion? Why is it the lion? Is it the strongest animal? Mm -mm. No, it's not. It really has a royal look, but it's not the strongest animal. The tiger, for instance, is the biggest cat, and it's stronger than the lion. And you have elephants, rhinos, hippos, and some other. By the way, now listen carefully, kids again. Who is the king of the American animal kingdom. <laughs> the king of the American animal kingdom. Have you heard about the bison? The American buffalo? Did you know in 2016 it was declared to be the national mammal? of the United States? Haven't you ever seen a video, a lion versus a buffalo? And uh, the buffalo, the bison, not the American, gives a, a, a heck to the lion and is torn open. Even the bison is stronger than the lion. It seems that it's more like a myth surrounding the lion that made this beautiful animal and strong and a fierce predator the king of the animal kingdom. Some say even bears are stronger than lions. In reality, we don't know because bears and lions don't meet in real life. But in the country of my origins, we don't have lions, we don't have bisons. We used to have them back in history, but some people loved bison steak and they ate them. We only have a few in reservations now. But we have bears, I mean plenty of them. Yeah, big brown bears. And you don't want to mess with a bear. There are all kinds of crazy stories when these people looking for trouble would barehandedly walk up to the den of the bear, and then they are surprised to see that Mr. Bear comes out and barehandedly tears them apart. I don't, you don't want to mess with a beast. When I was a child, bears were very rare in that area because of the massive hunting, they were almost extinct. But then some draconic laws were put in place and now they are all over the place. And they are bold and brave enough to enter households in search of food and there have been many attacks of bears on humans as well. It's in the news, the bear hit again. Last summer, Anda and myself had a chance to hike a little bit in the mountains. You should know that she is from the mountain. I am from a lower part of the country. So in my childhood, we would roam the forest carelessly. We would never be afraid of any beast. So just like usual, you know, hiking in the mountain, 
we would uh, carelessly walk around Rome in the forest. But then in the evening, first night, we went to our lodging, and uh, I was surprised to see that that facility was surrounded by electric fans. Uh-oh, what is that for? Obviously, Mr. Bear had visited them, and they knew the bear would hit again. So now they surrounded the thing with wire and run electricity through it. Well, that next day, we were a little more careful. We had become aware now of uh, what is happening in the area up in the mountain. Next evening, again, for lodging, totally different place, same reality, all surrounded with wire, electricity running through it. Hmm. It sounds pretty serious. So I can tell you, from that point on, we were, we were walking like this, you know. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> you never know. And then you read in the news and uh, hear it uh, in the news that, hey, the bear, the beast, hit again. The beast hit again. We are in Daniel chapter 7. Daniel's chapter 7 is looked upon by many as being the heart of the book of Daniel. We are entering now the prophetic part of the book of Daniel. We have looked in the first six chapters of the book at how God worked in history past. We are starting now looking at how God works in history future from the perspective of the one that wrote the book of Daniel. From now on, the language becomes more mysterious, symbolic, figurative. It's interesting that chapter 7 has portions of prose and also, also portions of poetry. And uh, it has an interesting structure. I would like us to look at that structure. We have the vision about the bees right at the beginning. We have then a vision of a courtroom, a heavenly courtroom, and the Son of Man coming with the clouds right at the top. And... At the opposite end, we have the interpretation of those visions. So, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are asking that your Spirit will open our hearts and minds. This is becoming now more difficult, more challenging. May Jesus Christ be lifted up. And may He give us the assurance we need in His name through the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the first year of Belshazzar, Daniel has a dream. He has several visions in that dream. This dream happens some 50 years after King Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 2, had his dream, and you will see that there are some similarities between Daniel's dream in chapter 7 and Nabucco's dream in chapter 2. Daniel says that he saw a dream, and uh, in chapter 7, verse 2, he says, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea, and four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. Right at the beginning of the chapter, we are told that Daniel just gives us the main facts. In Hebrew, in Aramaic here, the head facts. 
So we don't have all the description of everything he saw. We have the main, the head facts. And the first vision is indeed about four bees. I'm going to try to act out some components of uh, these visions so that we can follow the chronology of them. The first vision, the vision about the bees, starts with a beast that looks like a lion. It's not a lion because it has wings, the wings of an eagle. So it's a hybrid kind of thing. But it looks like a lion. We know from history that the lion was a symbol for the Babylonian kingdom. So this is parallel to chapter 2, what was the head of that image? It was gold, gold, golden head. Pretty golden color, this one too. So this is the first beast Daniel sees. Good. The second one, you may think probably that still the bear is somewhat weaker than the lion. That may be the case. There's a debate on that. But what I know from history past, from the book of Daniel, that is that when a kingdom passes from one dominion to the other, it's not necessary because this one is stronger. Yes, this bear has three ribs between his teeth. But when a kingdom passes, it's because God, it's because God passes that kingdom on to the next power. And then the third one is a leopard. I couldn't find the right one. A leopard that has, again, it's, it's weird. It has four heads and uh, four wings. So that's Babylon, the, the golden head. That's Medo-Persia. What was there? Silver. Silver, breasts, and arms. And this one is the Greek Empire corresponding to copper or bronze belly and thighs. Okay? All good so far. Problem is, the fourth animal, the fourth beast, is unlike anything else. And uh, I can tell you, this is unlike the rest of what I have there. The description is extremely interesting. Seven, starting with verse seven, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth, iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. Please notice three elements, those three elements, backwards, those three elements in red, iron, feet, and ten. What does that remind you of? In the image that Nabucco saw, the feet were iron, so you have pretty strong hints there, and the toes were how many? Twelve, right? No, ten. Good. Verse eight, so this is the Roman Empire that follows the Greek Empire. It was, I was considering, contemplating, says the Aramaic, the horns. The horse. So, so the focus is already on the horse. And not even the horse, the ten horn confederacy, really. And there was another horn, that's the focus. A little one coming up. It's coming up among them. 
before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. It goes on saying, and there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking pompous or great words. Now, the eyes like the eyes of a man seem to be a counterfeit here for the Son of Man that is going to appear in the next vision. So this is the first vision, starting here. But then, Daniel sees a second vision, and uh, the story now changes to poetry. It was prose up to this point. He sees another vision. I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne, so you have thrones, plural, and his throne, God's throne, was like fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. Who's this ancient of days? I'm looking at you, and some of you look somewhat like the ancient of days. <laughs> you know, there is in, in the Talmud, the Talmud is a, a Jewish religious literature. It said that when God goes to battle, his hair is black like a young man's. But then when he sits on his throne judging, make, doing justice, his hair is white as an old man's. We can relate to that, right? Because after a certain age, unless you die daily, you look like the ancient of days. Right? So God, it's not that He is old. That's not the picture. The picture is you have a wise judge doing justice here, sitting on the throne, surrounded by other thrones. This is a very interesting picture. It appears in several places in the Bible because it seems that God doesn't do government and justice autocratically alone. He somehow, in this court, heavenly courtroom, or in this cosmic trial, he has some beings representative of unfallen words or unfallen beings, I believe, that are somehow as a panel of judges or justices around him, and together they do justice. It goes on, verse 8, a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated, and the books or the records or the tablets, the laptops if you want, were opened. The idea is there are some records based on which the court does justice. So now at this point, it's like the whole vision of this courtroom scene is interrupted by some pompous words spoken by who? The little horn. How do I know? Verse 11. I watched then because of the sound of the pompous words which the horn was speaking. I watched teal and this till is very important. Till the beast was slain. Which beast? This one. The fourth beast. Till it was slain and its body destroyed and given to the burning flame. The burning flame came from God's throne. So somehow there's a connection between this scene and that one of the courtroom. Meaning that this beast, its power, through that little horn that grew, came out, 
comes all the way down in history to the time where this judgment happens. And then you may ask, okay, but what happened to the other three? Daniel explains, like in a parenthetical flashback, he says, as for the rest of the beasts, they had, had their dominion taken away. Their dominion was taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. What does, that means is, when the bear conquers the lion, the bear doesn't eat the lion. The lion is still a strong part in the bear's kingdom. But then after a while, it's disintegrated and uh, it's integrated in the fabric of the new kingdom. So all these three are taken out. The power is taken from them, then taken out. But that one remains. And when this happens, because this description here about what, ha what is happening to the beast is like a bridge between the courtroom scene and the next scene, which is right here next to it, starting with verse 13. Look at that. I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man. Oh, wow. The Son of Man. You remember what was the picture that came after the feet of iron in chapter 2? A stone. I mentioned there a wordplay between Ben, son, and Eben, stone. That's a Hebrew wordplay. There you have the stone, Eben. Here you have the son. But it's the same reality. One like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. This is a picture of the second coming. You have it in other parts of the Bible as well. But this is what it says. He came. Actually, the Aramaic there is, He had come to the Ancient of Days, and they, brought, or that they had brought Him near before Him. This is what it means. Before Jesus appearing in the clouds of heaven, He had come and passed through here the courtroom scene. And he was brought here to the courtroom scene, and from the courtroom scene, he is coming now with the clouds. Meaning these two here, these two scenes here are connected, and there's that little bridge between them. Yes, first the judgment scene takes place. Justice is rendered by the Ancient of Day, surrounded by the other justices, and then Jesus, who was present there, comes from there. Why? Verse 14, then to him was given dominion and glory and kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. Wow. Interesting. So, here you have Daniel seeing all these three visions. One, the beast. This beast is, still, beast is still around. Those are taken out. Judgment scene. The activity of this beast continues all the way down because it's destroyed here in the fire. And then, after this judgment, Jesus Christ comes back, but he doesn't understand it. It says, I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit within my body. There's a very interesting expression there in the, the Aramaic. I was grieved in my spirit in the midst of its sheath. <laughs> it's like the spirit has a sheath, the body. And the visions of my head troubled me. Verse 16. I came near to one of those who stood by and asked him the truth about all this. 
So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. It's interesting that now the dream interpreter, because Daniel had the gift of interpreting dreams, he needs an interpreter. Hmm. Verse 17, look at this very concise, sweet and short explanation of the interpreter. So one of the beings that is in that scene, because now Daniel is like part of the scenario there. So the interpreter says, those great beasts, meaning this one and those that were taken out, which are four, are four kings or kingdoms. It's used interchangeably because in 23 it's kingdoms, which arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom. This is the first time it appears here that the saints of the Most High will receive the kingdom. They will receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Very short and comprised. But Daniel is not satisfied. He goes on, that I wish to know the truth about the fourth beast. That's my problem. That's what I, I want to know. I was watching and the same horn, the little one, but whose appearance now is greater than his fellows, according to verse 20, was making war against the saints and prevailing against them. Verse 22. Until the ancient, days, ancient of days came and a judgment was made in favor of the saints and the of the Most High, and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. So this beast, the fourth beast, through the little horn, was fighting and fighting and fighting, making war against the saints up to this point when the judgment was made, and then the kingdom was taken away from him and given to the saints. And this is the second time it appears that the kingdom will be given eventually to the saints. But Daniel still wants to understand. So the interpreter, and now it switches back again to poetry, comes to explain to Daniel what it means. 23. The fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth, the whole earth, trample it and break it in pieces. Verse 24, the ten horns, again the ten horn confederacy that reminds of the ten toes in Daniel chapter 2, this is a continuation, an extension and continuation of the Roman Empire somehow. The focus is not even the ten horns, because again the focus is that little horn, and another shall arise after them. He shall be different from the first ones, and shall subdue three kings. The ten horn confederacy can easily be a symbol of uh, political powers that somehow stem out of the Roman Empire, imperialism, and then we have colonialism that brought imperialism all over the place on the planet. You can go online and look at some maps, see how colonialism started from where the Roman Empire used to be. And then we ended up these days speaking about globalism or the global village. But now, in verse 25, we have some specific details of what this little horn that grew and became big, that is an extension and continuation of the Roman Empire. It comes in the wake of the Roman Empire. He shall speak words against or at the side of the Most High. I think it's a better translation with at the side of. 
And to explain that, I would need somebody to join me right here. Nick, can you please jump up here? So this power, this superpower, this superpower comes at the side of the Most High and speaks pompously or greatly, obviously, not for him, against him. Right? Because it's an enemy of the Most High. Thank you so much. So, my question is this. Is there a superpower that came in the wake of the Roman Empire as an extension and continuation of the Roman Empire that came at the side of the Most High and spoke for him, that is, against him? Shall persecute or wear out the saints of the Most High. The word persecute is actually wear out, like a piece of cloth, cloth, wear out. Have you heard about attrition warfare or war of attrition? You know what it means? You prolong it until you wear down your enemy. So again, we have a situation here that takes a long time. It's a wear out kind of warfare going on between the little horn power, world power, and the saints of the Most High. Is there any kind of superpower coming in the wake of the Roman Empire as an extension and continuation of it? Because the beast is still around. that does this, wear out the saints, and shall intend or try to change times and law. Change times? In Daniel chapter 2, verse 21, there's a very interesting Hebrew parallelism. A Hebrew parallelism is you have a line, a thought, and that line is paralleled in a second thought, and that second thought explains the first. And this is what the line is. And he changes the times and the seasons. Who's that? This is about God. So the one that has the prerogative to change times and seasons is who? It's God. He's the one that changes times and seasons. What does that mean? He removes kings and raises up kings. Let me ask you, do you know of any superpower that came in the wake of the Roman Empire as an extension and continuation of it, because the fourth beast is still around, that assumed this divine prerogative of placing and removing kings? Like, for instance, if you and I lived in the first century, somewhere where today is Germany, on the territory of the Holy Roman Empire. If we elected a king, who wants to be the king here? Uh, raise your hand if you want to be the king. No, no, what's your name? Leah. Leah. You cannot be the queen. You know why? You first have to go to somebody, and if that somebody representing a power coming in the wake of the Roman Empire as an extension and a continuation of it, if that power allows you to be the queen, then yes, you can be our queen. Nice queen. But this power does something else, too. What does it do? Next verse. It's trying to change the law. It's in the previous part of that verse. 
before, yes, that's the final word there. Changing the law. The law, the word there in Aramaic, that, is a translation, the Aramaic translation of the Hebrew word Torah. Torah. Now, it's very difficult to say exactly how things happen. But I'm just looking at historic Christianity, and this is what I notice. God's Torah, because the word explicitly refers to God, has been changed in various ways. First, the content was changed. How? Torah, normally, in Hebraic thought, refers to the five books of Moses. But now, if you ask about law in a Christian circle, most people will say maybe the Ten Commandments. But even the Ten Commandments, how? Well, the second commandment was eliminated. The fourth was changed. Then all those was, were slided one piece so that when you reach the tenth, you will have it cut in two pieces because if you take one out of ten, you have nine, so you need ten, so you have it back. That's the way in historic Christianity. The Decalogue, which is just the constitution of the Torah, the Torah is much more than that. The Torah is an expansion of that as well. But it's not only that it was abridged, it was also expanded or extended. How? Through human and church tradition. Because that's the church law, really, in historic Christianity. So the content was changed. But the nature of the law was changed as well. Because instead of speaking about God's Torah as being a law of life, a law that gives you the context of life, a law that God designed you for, instead of that kind of law, the law became an arbitrarily imposed law, imposed from God by the church, not only His law, but also the human tradition that was added to it. And as well, content, nature, the role of the law is changed. If, uh, according to the Bible, the role of God's law is once you accepted God out of love, you obey His law as a result of your changed life because you want to live your life according to the designer, instead of a result of salvation, the law plus human tradition becomes a means of salvation through which you save yourself from an angry God because if not, He will hit you hard and punish you. Do you know of any world power that did that kind of thing coming in the wake of the Roman Empire as an extension and a continuation of the Roman Empire? One more hint in the final part of the verse, yes. Then the saints shall be given into his hands, or and the saints shall be given into his hands for a time and times and half a time. That in the Bible also appears as 1,260 days or 42 months. Time, times, which is double of this, and half time. Credit to Michael Morton. Okay? We could spend the rest of this morning doing the math, you know, see how things add up. Leave that aside now. Do you know of uh, 
a superpower coming in the wake of the Roman Empire, as an extension and continuation of the Roman Empire, that persecuted the saints of the Most High for a prolonged period of time. I know one. You know how I know? The representatives of that world power came out and apologized. They apologized for the atrocities of Inquisition, for the evils of the Crusades, and also for the sins of colonialism. Watch this. Do your research. Go online. Type the word Inquisition. And search and see who is the superpower behind the killing machinery of the Inquisition. A machinery that would burn the saints at the stake, baptize them until they drown, bury them alive, or tear them into pieces for centuries. I don't want to scare you, but if one of you lived in those times, or if I lived in those times, there's a likeliness I would be taken and brought in front of the inquisitors, and they would pressure me, they would torture me to elicit a confession. If I don't give up my Bible-based faith, say, for instance, the Sabbath, but just as an example, then they would continue to pressure me and torture me, and if I still do not give up, then they would even kill me. This is facts. So yeah, they came out and apologized. It wouldn't have been easy to hide it. Did you know that to these days there are church building, historic church building in Europe that have a torture chamber? Torture chamber in a church building? For what? Well, the saints were taken there, tortured by inquisitors, because they thought it was their divine mandate to make those saints recant or retract. Otherwise, it was a good thing for society for them to be eliminated, taken out. I know these days there's a rewriting of history. And the way it's rewritten is like, yeah, I know we did that, it wasn't that bad. Instead of like 50 million people that some speak about, it was maybe like 30,000. Wait, 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 wait. If it was only one, how can you torture or kill even one of the saints of the Most High in the name of Jesus Christ or in the name of the cross. One, not two, not three, not ten, not one hundred, one. How can you, in the name of the cross, in the name of Jesus Christ, tell somebody, hey, you're wrong, I'm right, and therefore, I'm going to burn you, or bury you alive, or tear you into pieces. How can you do that? Somebody may say, yeah, but that's what, not the only superpower that persecuted the saints. Correct? Correct. All superpowers that persecuted the saints were moved by the same spirit that moved this superpower. But this specific superpower came in the wake of the Roman Empire 
as an extension and continuation of the Roman Empire. That's my struggle here. Okay, you may say, yeah, but they apologized. Apology granted. Do they still do it? You may ask. No, they are not doing it that way. But the mere fact that they are not doing it that way is no safety. Know why? Because this prophecy tells me that the beast is going to hit again. How do I know? Look at verse 26. But the court shall be seated and they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it forever. So only here will the dominion taken be away right before the second coming. Verse 27, then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. The third time now. It shall be given to the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and all dominions shall serve and obey Him, Him the Most High. Do you still remember my electric fence? The electric fence? Why was it put there? Because they knew the beast will hit, would hit again. Imagine one day I'm there hiking in the mountains and I reach one of those places where I saw the wire, the electric fence, and I see them removing the wire. I'm going to them and tell them, uh, gentlemen, don't do it. Why not? No, no, that's dangerous. Why is it dangerous? <sighs> we haven't seen a bear in this area for quite some time now. Listen, don't remove the fence because the bear will hit again one day. Let me ask you, is the mere fact that they have not seen a bear around, a beast around for quite some time, a safety that they will never see a beast around again? Now watch this. Right now, we live in a time where we have already removed the fence. Are you listening? We have removed the fence. We are doing picnic in the backyard. The kids are running all over the place. We are having such a fun time. But this prophecy tells you and me that the beast will hit again. So then you may ask, okay, so, so is this thing, the three or time, times, and half a time happening right here? Uh-uh, no. You know why? Because the book of Revelation speaks about the same power, world superpower. In chapter 13, verse 3, it says, and I saw one of his heads as if, Notice, as if it had been mortally wounded or slain unto death, the Greek, and his deadly wound was healed. So you have this superpower receiving a wound that looks as if it was mortal. It's not mortal, because if it was mortal, then you have it gone. You understand what I'm saying? It looks as if it was mortal, meaning that it's not, it's going to heal. Oh, so there is a part here where persecution happened. Then there is a part here where the mortal wound is healed. And then the beast will hit again. I know it's hard to say. Biblical prophecy. Let me show you the other verse, 17, verse 8. The beast that you saw was, is not, 
but and will ascend. Same exact picture. I have to confess, I am troubled by this Bible prophecy. And it's not only me. Daniel was troubled too. Verse 28. This is the end of the account. Just head facts. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly troubled me. And my countenance changed. But I kept the matter in my heart. Keep it in your heart. 